Hello. Today we're going to learn about the distortion energy theory, also called von Mises stress. Now this theory was developed by Richard von Mises in about 1913. Von Mises was an Austrian polymath, meaning he was a great engineer, scientist, mathematician, as well as philosopher. He developed this theory for ductile materials, and the theory states that yielding occurs when the distortion strain energy per unit volume reaches or exceeds the distortion strain energy per unit volume for yielding in a simple tension or compression test. So the heart of this theory is the distortion strain energy. Now let's try to do some derivations and understand what, you know, and figure out what strain energy is and what is the distortion strain energy within a unit volume. To get there, let's start with the stress tensor. We know that stress exists as a tensor, a uh, matrix that consists of six terms, the diagonal, which is normal stress, and the off diagonals, which are shear stresses. That tensor, sigma, can be divided into two portions, a hydrostatic portion that's involved in change in the volume of a, of a, of a structure, and a distortional portion which is involved in the change in uh, shape of a volume. We can divide it as follows, that the stress tensor is equal to the average normal stress times an identity a matrix plus a distortion, uh, a deviatoric stress tensor, right? Where the average normal stress is a scalar, the identity tensor is just a matrix with ones in the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And our deviatoric stress is full of the stresses that cause change in shape. Now we can, you know, visualize this uh, in, in another way. If we say we had a stress element and we rotate it, rotated it such that we just have principal stresses applied to it, then the hydrostatic component uh, is fairly simple. It's the average stress expressed over each of those nor uh, normal directions, where the average stress is sigma one plus sigma two plus sigma three divided by three, a scalar quantity. And then to find the distortional component, we simply rearrange the stress equation so that the deviatoric stress is equal to the full stress tensor minus the average normal stress times that identity uh, matrix so that, you know, sigma A is on the diagonal terms. Not too bad, right? A is on our diagonals. So now we've got an idea of stress in terms of hydrostatic portions, the ones that cause pure volume change, and distortional or deviatoric stresses that call change in shape, angular distortions. Now let's learn the concept of strain energy. Let's consider a stress element that is subjected to uniaxial tension. So we're just applying tension in one direction. Let's assume that element is linear elastic, it is isotropic, and it's a homogeneous material. Strain energy is equal to the area under the stress-strain curve. So if we have a stress-strain curve and the material responds linear elastically, the area under that curve is the strain energy. For a uniaxial loading condition, uh, assuming uh, linear elastic, this area is simply uh, equal to one half of the strain that's been accumulated times the stress that's been accumulated. So if we know this point, we're basically finding the area of that triangle uh, formed by that point, where U is a strain energy per unit volume within our structure. And this is for just uniaxial stress. Now, let's consider a stress element subject to triaxial uh, tension. So we are loading in every normal direction to a value of sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. In that case, the strain energy per unit volume is calculated as follows, where that energy U is equal to one half in brackets, a to one times sigma one plus a to two times sigma two plus a to three times sigma three. So we have a much longer equation. We're taking the energies that are accumulating in every direction in this volume, right? Okay. 
Now, let's do something to this. Right now we have it in terms of stress and strain. Let's apply Hooke's Law and let's re replace the strains that we see with stress uh, in, that, in, that, um, in, in this equation. Let's replace all of these strains with stress and then we end up with strain energy all in terms of principal stresses. So we end up with this very long form equation it's all in terms of stress. We have Young's modulus and we have Poisson's ratio inside of this equation, right? Okay. Now that we have the total strain energy for a triaxial state of stress, now let's consider applying this strain energy concept to the hydrostatic component and the deviatoric component. So uh, we've already got it, you know, this is in terms of triaxial. Well, let's find our hydrostatic component where we have average normal stresses applied on each surface. In that case, we find the volumetric strain energy as equal to the follows. Three times uh, the average normal stress squared divided by two times Young's modulus times in brackets, one minus two times Poisson ratio, close the bracket. So now we have our volumetric strain energy. And then to get our distortional or deviatoric strain energy, we simply take the strain energy of the total system um, minus, I think we've got a typo here, should be minus uh, the, the average um, strain energy. And we end up with our deviatoric or distortional strain energy term. Pretty long, complicated term, all in terms of stresses and our elastic properties. So now we've got that base concept of what is the distortional strain energy within a unit volume. So now let's then derive the von Mises uh, uh, equation. Let's consider a tensile sample that's loaded up to yield it, such that the state of stress, sigma one, is equal to the yield strength of the material and sigma two and sigma three are equal to zero. In that case, the distortional strain energy is one plus mu divided by E times the yield strength squared. So this is our criterion for our material. If we then evaluate the distortional strain energy, if the strain energy is equal to this material property, then we can say that yielding has occurred in our stress element. Now, if we simplify the like terms, if we remove the, some of the like terms uh, between both sides and rearrange, we'll find that we'll find the von Mises stress. That uh, the stresses, if the stresses in our stress element exceed, great, are greater than or equal to the yield strength of our material, then failure occurs or yielding occurs. Now, if we look at this, this criterion, we can see that this is a nonlinear equation. It's not as simple as the maximum shear stress theory that we already saw. Um, and we also can see that it is a scalar quantity. And so this expression, this equation here, we often call the von Mises stress, this calculation from our stress element, the von Mises stress. Now, we also can um, apply this uh, in, uh, as a design criterion, where the von Mises stress is equal to the yield, uh, yield strength divided by N, where N is our design safety factor. Now, the von Mises stress can also be written in many different ways. Um, the way that we've derived is the von Mises stress in 3D in terms of principal stresses, so this form of the equation. But we also could have it in terms of 2D plane stress, a simplification in this form of the equation. We also can express von Mises stress in terms of our general stresses, in terms of X, Y, and Z, where in 3D, it's a pretty long form equation. And where in 2D, it's a little bit shorter, but still a pretty long equation. In all of these uh, four cases, the sigma that we see here is the von Mises stress, a scalar quantity that if greater than the yield strength, uh, then yielding occurs in our structure. So the question is, uh, how do we decide which equation to use? Well, we should ask ourselves two questions. 
One, is a problem 3D or is it 2D? And the other thing is, is it in terms of principal stresses or do I have, this, have the general stresses? Between those two decisions, you can figure out which equation to use. And now finally, if we uh, considered a, uh, a geometry under torsion, we can find the, or under shear, the torsional yield strength derived from the von Mises theory is that the torsional yield stress is equal to 0.577 times the tensile yield, yield strength of a material. So von Mises finds that the torsional yield strength is 15% higher than the maximum shear stress theory. Now, how do we generate uh, the yield surface for von Mises? Well, von Mises is a nonlinear equation. So we can't just set case one, two, and three like we did for maximum shear stress theory. We actually just have to plot this equation out numerically. And when we plot it out numerically, we find an oval shape on in stress space where our x axis is sigma one, our y axis is sigma two we find that we get an oval shape, and that oval shape goes through the average line of the experimental data. And so what does that mean? Um, that means that uh, the distortion energy curve matches the data best. It's much better than the maximum shear stress theory. It typically uh, equates to a 50% reliability of a design meaning half of the data points or experimental values are below the yield surface and half are on the outside. It averages the failure uh, or the yielding that we would expect. Uh, this uh, theory, this von Mises theory is commonly used for analysis. And the von Mises stress is the default stress that's employed in finite element analysis. And with that said, we know about von Mises. We know what we need to know about distortion uh, energy theory. And uh, see you in the next video.